Okay, thanks very much for having me. Um, I'm a research ecologist with USDA ARS, so I spend most of my time doing research, although I also do teach an agroecology class in the University of Illinois Crop Sciences Department. Okay, so the topic today is an integrated weed management toolkit. And it, the talk is going to contain material that's really relevant across the weed management spectrum from full-on organic growers to conventional growers. And um, a lot of the uh, tactics that I talk about today um, are tactics that address the specific ecological characteristics of weeds. They grow out of weed ecology. So when you're developing integrated weed management strategies, you can think about it um, the term that we use in weed ecology is many little hammers. So rather than one big hammer where you're placing all of your emphasis on a single approach working, like just using an herbicide or just relying on the cultivator, you need to think about how to create stresses, um, multiple stresses on a weed. And so this slide here says target all stages of the life cycle. The weed that I've shown right here is uh, yellow or wild mustard. All right, well, um, so this is a life cycle of an annual weed. And so we start with um, seed production. The mature plant produces seeds that are then um, dispersed to the soil. Those seeds survive at some rate. They germinate they grow and then become reproductively mature again. Each of those life stage transitions in a weed life cycle are an opportunity to do something. So for example, at this uh, stage where the plant is reproductively mature, um, you might decide if you're, if you're an organic grower that you don't want it to be able to return seed to the field and you have a crew out there chopping or pulling. Um, if you've got seeds germinating, you might decide that um, rather than uh, just let the seeds, most of the seeds be dormant and some portion of them germinate, you're going to actually provoke them into germinating, creating what's called a stale seed bed. And um, each of these stages has some management tactic that can be especially associated with it. And together, when you have all of these little effects on different stages of the life cycle, you can come up with a management strategy that really does slow down weed population growth. Okay? A second major principle in use in developing integrated weed management strategies is using a diverse set of tools. So, um, up in this upper left-hand corner here, I've got a picture of a three-phase cropping system. We've got uh, soybean, we've got small grain, and we've got corn here. And uh, as I'll show later, crop rotation is one of the strongest, most potent tools that you can have in managing weeds. We can also think about managing uh, plant residues. So this is rye that then has been, or excuse me, what's being rolled here, sorry, is hairy vetch, um, using a mechanical crimper roller and uh, forming a very dense surface mulch that can prevent weed germination. We've got a carabid beetle over here, or a ground beetle, which uh, is a voracious predator of seeds. And we've got a rotary hoe. There are, these are, this is just a small sampling of some of the tools that are available to growers. So in this uh, diagram here, let me take you through this. Um, we've got an inner circle which represents different operations during the annual cropping cycle. And we've also got an outer circle we're going from seedling emergence to establishment and growth, plant maturation, and seed burial. This outer circle looks at um, 
read life stages. And so when you think about designing management strategies that target those different life stages, it's important to think about what's actually happening with management or agronomic management at the same time. So I've got letters here, A through E, that talk about some potential sources of lead management benefits at each of those life stages. So for example, at letter A, where we've got, and so this is a summer annual weed, a spring planted crop, like corn or soybean. At A, we've got fall tillage or burn down. Some of these sources of weed mortality include seed decay, seed predation, aging of seeds, depth placement of seeds, and loss of seeds dormancy. Um, going into spring, where you're preparing the seed bed, you can think about ways of trying to increase fatal germination of weed seedlings. For example, when seeds are placed below the depth at which they can successfully germinate, um, if they're stimulated through tillage at that point, they can germinate but then die before they reach the surface. Um, allelopathy is uh, when you've got uh, plant residues uh, exerting a chemical effect on seedlings in the soil. So for example, if you plow down a green manure, um, you can have pretty much a pre-emergence herbicide effect on weed seeds before they are able to emerge. Uh, at the time of seedling emergence, then of course you do have physical control options uh, such as a rotary hoe or an inter-row cultivator in an organic system. In a conventional system, this is the time when someone would apply um, a post-emergence herbicide. But another thing to not forget is that your crop can actually be the single best and strongest uh, defense against weed growth. And I'll show you some data later uh, that shows how crop competition can benefit uh, integrated weed management. Hey, Adam, just for your perspective, our, our group that we have, um, you did mention the uh, cover crops and like the rye and what have you. This group of growers, that's becoming a, a really big management tool for a number of reasons, and one is weed control. So a lot of the people you're talking to today on, on small, smaller scales will be using um, especially that one. Okay, that's good to know. So um, cover crops can help uh, provide weed management in a few different ways. So you know, I just talked about allelopathy through the chemical effects of a green manure that's plowed down. But then you also have cover crops providing habitat for seed predators. Um, if you know, you've got, for example, have a forage legume growing at the same time as you might have an adjacent uh, summer annual grain crop, the forage legume can provide uh, habitat for seed predators that are then feeding on seeds within the summer annual crop. Um, then you've also got simple physical suppression of weeds trying to make it um, through that mat of mulch. And I've got some slides on that as well. Okay, so crop rotation is something that's been, it, it's an art that has been forgotten to a large extent in large commercial operations in the upper Midwest. But it's something that everybody did and something that we can continue to do. And the thing about crop rotation that's so powerful is if you start choosing crops that have different phenologies, phenology means the uh, timeline of crop development, you can dramatically change the types of stresses that uh, are imposed on the weed. So for example, in the two-year corn-soybean rotation, you've got canopy cover by the corn and the soybean plants occurring at basically the same time of year. You know, you're putting down your chemistry roughly at the same time in early to mid-spring. You've got your field preparation and uh, you've got your fall field preparation. What happens in a system like that is that the weed community becomes selected to 
be very well adapted to that growing environment. In comparison, when you've got a four-year rotation and you've got corn followed by soybean, both summer annual crops, then followed by uh, fall planted small grain with a forage legume underneath, now you're breaking the life cycle of the weeds by introducing crop canopy at a different time of year. If you follow up that small grain year with a year of an entire uh, devoted to a forage legume like a red clover or alfalfa, then you really begin to reduce opportunities for weeds to grow and compete with the crop. And you can see that the overall effect in the four-year rotation is to take stresses against the weeds and spread them out throughout the life cycle. So we've got repeated mowings, we've got repeated cultivations, we've got canopy that's lasting much longer time. So summer annual weeds, they may be happy in the corn and soybean years, they are not so happy in the small grain and forage legume years. And this is a deceptively simple but very powerful method. And for organic growers amongst the group, I'm sure this is nothing new. Um, however, we have to get creative about how we design our crop rotations and cropping systems and realize that if we don't uh, choose crops with contrasting uh, phenologies or time in which they develop, we're going to lose a lot of the power of the rotation. Here's an example, uh, well, close to 30 years ago now, um, where uh, we see Shriver created an experiment in which he looked at three different cropping systems and found that as he moved from a continuous corn to a corn-soybean rotation and then a soybean-wheat corn rotation, that giant foxtail densities dropped off dramatic, dramatically in each of the years of the study. So just including that third crop made an enormous difference. This was without any other differences in weed management between the three systems. Crop rotation itself had a suppressive effect on the weeds. This is a study that I wrote up and came out last, or two falls ago now, and created a bit of a stir. We uh, titled it Increasing Cropping System Diversity Balances Productivity, Profitability, and Environmental Health. And in this system, we had a two, three, and four-year uh, crop sequence. So maize followed by soybean, maize, soybean, oat underseeded with red clover, or maize, soybean, oat under seed of alfalfa. And um, we grew these plots at a fairly large scale. Each of these um, replicate blocks, or these plots within the replicate blocks, is about a half a hectare, um, a little over an acre. And so it was at a scale where growers could come in and see we were using field scale equipment. And the results showed us that um, we could, in fact, balance these three major goals of agriculture. So here, this is a radar plot. And each of the points on this radar plot shows some of the outcomes. So I'm going to start at the top. We've got maize yield, soybean yield, and harvested crop mass. The gray line is the four-year rotation. The dotted line with the open circle is the three-year rotation, and the solid line with the solid circle is the two-year rotation. The um, maize and soybean yield and crop mass were actually all greater in the three- and four-year rotations than in the two-year rotation. Profit was similar amongst the three. When you get to labor and energy use, you can see that there's a crossover. We did require more labor in the three and four year rotations where we, you know, were cultivating, we were doing cuttings of alfalfa or red clover, um, and uh, we were applying manure, um, but also used quite a bit less fossil energy than in the two year system. So we were substituting labor for inputs here. Now let's get to the part of the circle where we are looking at some of the outputs that are negative. Well, um, synthetic inputs 
of nitrogen fertilizer were quite a bit lower in the three and four year system than in the two year system. And that's because we were relying on inputs from both the forage legumes as well as the manure. Herbicide use was also dramatically lower. Freshwater toxicity, because of our reduced herbicide use, was much lower. And yet the rate at which we were depleting the weed seed bank, which is a measure of long-term sustainable weed management, was exactly the same for all three systems. So what we showed here was a proof of concept that you can maintain profitability and food production in your system while dramatically reducing the environmental impact of the system and still keeping a handle on weeds. Here is looking at the data over time. So this is the weed seed bank up on top going down in all three systems at the same rate. This is weed biomass, which was negligible. So this is, to give you an idea, this is megagrams per hectare. The corn yields were 14 megagrams per hectare. We're down at 0 0.005 to 0 0.02 megagrams per hectare of weed biomass. Basically, we had to search on our hands and knees for weeds. We had so few, for so few weeds in this field. In addition to crop rotation being an important first line of defense, um, we can think about ways of preventing germination. So this is a study that I did on Blue Moon Organic Farm with John Chernis. And uh, we just wanted to ask, is there benefit to applying a ground cover in the form of a mulch um, in comparison with bare soil? And you can see, you know, visually, clearly, you know, there's a lot of chickweed and purslane here. Um, in that bare soil, you can't see much where we either cut buffalo grass or applied um, a rye straw mulch. And um, I got to say that John was very skeptical about the value of the labor and the cost of the mulch for his weed control. He felt that weed control was adequate. And why should he bother to add this extra layer of complexity to his farming operation? So we decided to actually study that and we were collecting weed biomass as well as tomato yields and keeping track of the costs as we went along. So the basic take home here is that when you've got mulch, you have less weeds and you've got more tomatoes, which is kind of a no-brainer, but that's what we saw. Um, so over here with weed biomass, uh, we saw you know, many times more weed biomass where we didn't have any ground cover than when we had either a grass or straw mulch. And it didn't really matter uh, which type of ground cover we used. The grass uh, mulch was from, um, he had grass growing in the intros and then used the side discharge mower to actually take the grass and shoot it on below the tomato bases. Straw was, we bought bales of straw in. And then you can see that there was a slight a decrease in tomato yield where you didn't have the mulch as well. When he penciled it out, what he found was that the mulch paid for itself 10 times over. So it, and this is a, based on 300 row feet with 200 plants in each of the replicates. And uh, so it cost him about $55 to mulch uh, each of those areas. And um, there was a little bit more uh, harvest cost. However, because of increased uh, yield, overall, there was an enormous economic advantage to using that mulch. So it was a case where John uh, went in thinking that he already had the problem licked and uh, found out that, in fact, there was quite a bit more he could do without uh, nearly as much effort as he thought. OK, so in that previous study, we were taking a cut mulch and applying it under a field crop situation. Um, that wouldn't be a really useful method. And so Rodale Institute, back in 2004, revisited an old tool called the Cover Crop Roller Printer. This tool was developed in Brazil and actually has been used for decades there. And they reinterpreted it for use behind, being pulled behind the tractor rather than behind an ox. And um, the idea is 
basically to grow a cover crop and then terminate it physically with this roller rather than burn it down like you would in a conventional system. And so over to the right you can see um, this is uh, Todd Dale, much as a uh, assistant, rolling some hairy vetch with the roller. And you can see what the hairy vetch looks like once it's dried down after several days. One of the things about doing this is that you really have to be on target with um, the phenology of the crop. And I'm, I admit to being somewhat of a hairy vetch phobe. Um, I, it scares me a bit because it uh, goes to seed and it can come back on you as a weed. So um, some of the folks at USDA ARS in Beltsville have acknowledged this problem and are working on breeding um, a variety of hairy vetch that doesn't have as much seed dormancy and flowers uh, more synchronously. This is a field of rye that was mowed. This was in, in my plots in Urbana. And um, we were producing quite an enormous amount of biomass with this approach. Uh, we were producing anywhere between uh, 7 and 11 tons per acre of rye biomass and then rolling it down with this crimper. So again, you have to wait until you're right uh, at flowering. And it's kind of scary because you're afraid the rye is going to go to seed. But um, if you're there at about 95% anthesis with rye and you roll it, then the stems will crimp nicely and it'll die within three or four days and turn nice and white, tan. Um, if you go much earlier than that, uh, you have a problem with the rye bouncing back on you and then you'll have to roll it again. So. Um, it, it is a little bit like a game of chicken, but when you get used to it, it works reasonably well. I, I repeated this study here for seven years, and by the end of it, it had gotten pretty good at this method, but it did take a while. Well, I noticed that um, Kyle wrote about it being investigated on a smaller scale. That's right. Um, what is it? Earthway implements? There, there's a... Uh, forgetting the name of the folks who make that roller, but you can actually um, use a walk-behind tractor, like a BCS rototiller, and uh, have a, uh, a tow-behind roller crimper. We've got one at the uh, University of Illinois South Farms, and it seems to work pretty well. So just to get... Yeah, Adam, we're actually... My, Adam, myself, and a court colleague, Chris Enroth, are going to replicate. Um, we're doing some of this work over at Monmouth at the farm. We have a small plot, so we're looking forward to seeing what happens there. Excellent. Oh, yeah, Earth Tools, right, not Earthway, Earth Tools. Yeah. One of the things about those small rollers that I've noticed is that you need a lot of weight on the sides. Um, you can get a weight set from Walmart or Dick's Sporting Goods and put them on the axles on the side. Um, I think that the efficacy of these rollers varies a whole lot depending on soil type. And so the best results I've seen with the rollers are on sandier or lighter soils. On my nice soils, um, the fins don't penetrate as much. I tend to like to go when it's a little moister. But here you can see the um, interrows between these soybean plants are quite clean. We were... Um, in a three-year study where we were comparing the weed management benefits of the um, no-till roller crimper with that of some post-emergent herbicides, we actually found that we did not need a post-emergent herbicide for the two of the three years. In one of the three years, we had um, a bit of a weedy mess. But uh, here you can see that it keeps it relatively clean. And over here on the right, uh, you can see that the soybean yields were not terrible. These are organic soybean yields, so ranging from 40 to 50 bushels um, compared to the county average in a conventional soybean plot of 60 bushels per acre. So um, this is you know, single pass. We didn't go back in that field, and I think if you penciled that out, you'd come out pretty far ahead 
um, using this approach in an organic grain production system. All right, so we were just talking about preventing seedling germination, and you could do that with a mulch that was on the surface and physically disturbing uh, seedling emergence, or potentially with the allelopathic benefits of something like a rye mulch. If you've got germination, then the next thing is to prevent seedling establishment. But no doubt many of you in this room are familiar with uh, various mechanical strategies. This is a rotary hoe over here. Um, this is a springtime harrow in this upper right hand side uh, working a small grain. In this particular field you can't see what they've done but they've actually developed a very ingenious method of improving harrowing efficiency. This is in Denmark and uh, they injected their manure deep below the roots of the small grain crop so that it was out of reach of the weeds which are germinating from the top two inches of the soil. So you had a stronger small grain and weaker weeds and that resulted in greater harrowing efficiency where the, the small grain, the barley here, was able to resist the uh, jiggling effect of the springtime harrow but the weeds weren't. Down in this lower left corner, this is a farmer up in Michigan working with what's called a Bezerides cultivator. And this cultivator has a lot of steel on it. There are these spinners in the back. Uh, further up, there are these things called side knives and torsion meters and spiders. There's, in all, there's a gang, uh, four gangs of implements on this thing. And so you've got to adjust it very carefully or you can take out your crop. But um, this is something that uh, if, you're good, if you're good with equipment, can give you really fantastic intra-row, within-row weed management. Over here to the right, we've got a flamer. Um, people tend to be very in or very out of the flamer camp. Um, it takes a fair amount of equipment investment and also quite a bit of knowledge on how to get the best effects out of it. Um, the flamer doesn't actually burn the weeds. It ruptures the cells in the weeds by heating them up quickly. So it never lights anything on fire. It's just a quick pass of heat over the road. So this picture um, looks at the results of this Bezerides weeder on that previous slide. This is what we have here. So on the left hand shot, we've got typical field cultivation or inter-row cultivation plus a hand weeding following up. And on the right side, we've got that Bezerides implement with no hand weeding following up. And you can see that very difficult to tell the difference between the two, although that treatment on the right costs much less to a grower. So it can be a tool, it's not the only tool, but if, you, if you're going to use physical weed control as one of your important hammers, it may pay to learn how to do it a little better and uh, focus on that intro row area. So I mentioned earlier that crop competition can be a very important part of weed management. In the top slide here, there are three sweet corn hybrids, Spirit on the left, WHT2801 in the middle, and then GH2547 on the right-hand side. These, um, these are different processing varieties. They all taste good, but they have very different canopy characteristics. So you can see that Spirit has a very open canopy. WHT 2801 has a moderately open canopy and GH 2547 has a very closed canopy. When you take a look down at the bottom here, this is just some qualitative data representing the different levels of yield loss and weed seeds produced here. Um, there was a lot of yield loss in that open canopy spirit and a lot of weed seeds produced. You have more light coming through the crop canopy, there's more light for those weeds to utilize and more, they can both 
compete with the crop better and they can also produce more seeds. And so simply choosing a more competitive crop cultivar can go a long way towards providing weed management without any additional uh, management tactics on top of it. Now, if you're you know, a horticultural grower where quality really matters, it may be that you, know, you like the taste of spirit better than GH2547 and you're not going to change and so you're going to have to manage around that uh, reduced competitive ability of the crop. But if other things are equal, then it's better to choose a more competitive crop to reduce the need for other weed management tools. Here's an example of um, what the impact of that is. So we followed that sweet corn year looking at wild proso millet as a weed into snap bean production. So on the very same plots, same treatments, we just simply planted snap beans the following year. And um, what we found was that in this lower hand, left hand graph here, wild proso millet production in sweet corn had a strong relationship to the number of wild proso millet seedlings that were coming up in the snap beans. And that makes sense. If you got a lot of seeds there you, the previous year, you'd expect a lot to germinate that next year. It's exactly what we saw. And that number of seedlings that we saw in May um, ended up being related uh, to the market yield of the sweet corn. So there was a negative relationship between the seedlings of wild crows and millet left over from seed production in sweet corn on snap bean in the following year. Now here's an example of thinking about the long term when you design a weed management system. That crop, crop competition in year one can have effects that are noticeable on yield loss in a crop in year two. Increasing seed mortality is a whole field unto itself and um, really hasn't received nearly enough attention from weed science. Most of the weed species that are problems in um, our field and horticultural crops are annuals in that they complete their life cycle in a single year. Some of them may be summer annuals where they germinate in the spring and produce seeds in late summer or early fall. Others may be winter annuals, of chickweed that emerge in the fall, grow over the winter, and produce their seeds in the spring. But for all of those species, when you uh, last a single year, the seed bank is actually the most important life stage to control in terms of reducing the population growth rate. So my unit in ARS we actually are studying factors that influence seed mortality. So up at the top here, we've got a scanning electron micrograph of a velvet leaf seed coat. And this is a healthy seed coat. And over here on the right, this is a decayed seed coat. And you can see all these little bacteria on the surface here. It's been colonized. <clears throat> and so what we've been trying to do is analyze these microbial communities and figure out which of the microbes are initiating decay in the seeds and how can we manage our soils to try to promote those particular microbes. So it's kind of an ongoing project on conservation biological control of weeds uh, using microbes. Well, you can also control seeds with things that you can see. This is a picture of giant foxtail seeds underneath a soybean canopy uh, when the soybean, soybeans are senescing, dropping their leaves. And you can see that none of these giant foxtail seeds has an actual seed inside the caryopsis. They're all empty. They've all been preyed upon, in this case, by mice. And it turns out that um, when you start looking across different agroecosystems, at levels of weed seed predation. It varies quite a bit, but they're always eating more than you might expect. The lowest number of seeds I've eaten, I've seen eaten across a season is about 30%, but it goes into the high 90s. So, you know, underneath um, forage legumes, 
you can see as many as 95%, 97% of the seeds produced by a stand of weeds uh, being eaten in a matter of days to weeks. The ones that do survive generally are surviving in little cracks in the soil like this or underneath plant residue like over here. But all the ones on the soil surface tend to get eaten. Here's an example of how um, you could have greater predation underneath a canopy that has more diversity. Here's a wheat red clover canopy. So this is wheat that was under seeded with red clover, and this is just bare wheat stubble. And you can see that there's an effect that persists throughout the duration of seed production. This is a giant foxtail seed production here. And um, when you take a look at the overall season-long predation rate, in this particular system, it was about 85% of the seeds that were produced were being eaten. And that's a real amount of weed control. If you want to take a look um, over a longer period of time, um, I, I followed up some of this work with a, a study in which I was looking at season-long predation in uh, cornfields uh, by ground beetles, uh, birds, mice, crickets, and earthworms don't eat seeds, but they handle them in an interesting way, which I'll show a little bit later. If you follow this process in a season-long way, you can learn interesting things about what causes it. So this graph here shows um, the proportion of seeds being eaten as you move from midsummer to fall. And uh, this is a velvet leaf up at the top, giant ragweed in the middle, and giant foxtail in the bottom. You can see that in general, invertebrate predation by crickets or carabids starts off high in the summer and gets lower in the fall. Whereas predation by small vertebrates like mice and birds it's pretty low in the summer and then increases as you go later in the fall. One of the things that we found in this work was that shelter or habitat really matters. On moonlit nights, mice and owls add up to mice being eaten by owls. And so if you want mice to keep feeding on a clear night, you need ground cover and that's what explains um, the ability of uh, systems with a forage leg in, in them to support higher rates of seed predation over time. So in this slide, this shows the complexity of agricultural food webs. So you know, seed feeders like crickets and crabid beetles are not just feeding on seeds by themselves are also part of a larger food web. So carabids bait switch sometimes and they also eat um, aphids, which are an insect pest. Um, they're also eaten by wolf spiders, as are crickets. When you plow fields, you generally reduce the number of wolf spiders. So you may be, in fact, um, reducing the amount of predation you have by, or excuse me, increasing the amount of predation you have by getting rid of uh, the predators of the seed predators. So it's a complicated set of interactions, but one that we need to learn to manage both at large scales for grain production and smaller scales for herd production. Okay, so what I've shown you so far is mostly results of field experiments. I tend to do a fair amount of modeling as well. And models are basically ways of taking ideas and pulling them together formally using mathematics. So this model here shows um, a population dynamics model for uh, weeds in an organic farming system. The demographic submodel means that it's, it's basically an accounting program that's uh, keeping track of different life stages of weeds. We've got seeds, small seedlings, large seedlings, and mature plants. So how many of these individuals are there at any given time? And let me take a look at the race. So this is a survival of seeds in the soil. 
this is germination for survival of cultivation, survival of hand weeding, and survival of seed predation. Now there's also an economic part of this model, and we look at the cost of controlling small seedlings and large seedlings, so that's reflected in control cost. We also look at the effect of large seedlings on lost crop residue, revenue, excuse me. And together, those give us an overall return to weed management over time. If we take a look at cost in terms of dollar per hectare five years out for different management strategies, and we take a look at variation in physical control success, hand weeding efficacy, seed bank decline, and seed predation, we can see some interesting things. So these curves here, this for example where I'm clicking is a change in hand weeding efficacy, that's that dotted line or dashed line. This solid line is physical control efficacy. The small dotted line is seed bank decline, and the dotted dashed line is seed predation. You can see that these different lines have different slopes. The steeper the slope, the more effective um, a uh, particular strategy is on reducing weed management costs. So you can see that the steepest slope is for hand weeding in an organic system here. So you have a lot of return to management effect. Physical control efficacy is next. Seed bank decline in seed predation has a much shallower slope, but look at the width of the box. So the um, light green boxes that I have here um, show the range of parameter values that have been observed in experimental systems. And although hand weeding has such a steep decline, what people have found is that you really can't get much more than 90 or 95% uh, successful at hand pulling weeds. There's just always some more left. And the uh, same goes for cultivation. It pretty much tops out at about 90% efficacy. In contrast, seed bank decline and seed predation, they go anywhere up between 0.2 and 0.9 in terms of their efficacy, and that, but it ha ends up, if you're at the top of the range, having quite a bit larger effect on management cost than the top of the range for uh, hand weeding and physical control. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't do hand weeding or physical control. What I'm saying is that if you manage your seed bank, it can provide an extra buffering effect that can help promote your overall weed management success and complement your hand weeding and physical control efficacy. Why would you want to do this? Because hand weeding is expensive. This is a hand weeding gang in Denmark being pulled along by a tractor. And it takes a lot of labor. This is weeding a carrot crop. It takes a lot of labor to get rid of weeds in a carrot crop. Very expensive if you're paying people a living wage to do this. But this is work that Bo Mellander did showing that the amount of time that you spend hand weeding crop like carrots is linearly related to the number of weeds that you have within the crop row. That makes sense. Now given the fact that this model tells us, oops, let me click back. This model tells us that we can help reduce our seed numbers and reduce costs with seed bank decline predation they can provide this excellent complement to hand weeding. So we want to be able to back off of the efficacy required in hand weeding by supplying better efficacy in seed mortality. And that's why my group has been spending so much time working on this. OK, so the weed seed bank is highly persistent, but I think that there's been information released that scares folks more than they need to be scared. So 
Burnside et al. in 1996 published a paper based on 21 years of um, seed burial experiments and published these values on the number of years needed to get 50% reduction in the seed bank. So for common lamb quarters, they said 12 years were needed, 8 years for velvet leaf, 4 for smart weed, all the way down to less than 1 for a giant foxtail or kosher. And I think that these numbers are overly pessimistic. Um, the reason being that Burnside and his crew and other folks who in that at that time were doing these seed barrel experiments, they were burying their seeds in glass jars and they were also burying them about 10 centimeters, 8 to 10 centimeters below, you know, uh, inches below the soil surface. We started a long-term seed experiment in my group uh, seven years ago where we were trying to create a more realistic situation so the seeds are in trays, they're within the top two inches of the soil surface which is where all the germination is taking place from and they're exposed to predators as well as the conditions that would make them germinate. When you expose seeds to these more realistic conditions you have much more optimistic numbers here. We're looking at two years for common lamb quarters compared to 12 years, two and a half years for velvet leaf compared to eight years, less than half a year for smart weed, 1.8 years for pig weed, you know, less than a year for kosher, so less than a year for common ragweed. These are all half-lives that are very doable for growers. It means that if you prevent seed return for even a couple of years, you're making an enormous impact on your weed seed bank. And so getting a chopping or pulling crew out there using um, creating habitat for seed predators can have a real impact on your long-term weed management success. So here's some data just showing that same steep decline. This is uh, 12 different species in this experiment. And um, you can see, for example, um, you know, in common water hemp, you know, five years on and we're down below one-fifth the number of seeds that we started off with. Common water hemp is the dominant weed in grain crops of the upper Midwest right now. Common lambs quarters, same situation. Velvet leaf is hanging on a little longer, but it actually is not a major uh, weed for most of us right now. I believe morning glory, again, way down there. So we're at a point now in your uh, seven, this is two years old, in year seven where we're having trouble finding any seedlings emerging. Um, so I think that uh, that seven years uh, weeding, one year seeding, seven years weeding is just about right. If you can keep up with your weeds and prevent seed return, you've got made a major investment in your farm in long-term weed management. When you're designing weed suppressive agroecosystems, you have to think about using a lot of tools that target a lot of life stages. So we've talked about preventing germination with mulches, also provoking germination with uh, stale seed beds. So, you know, timely cultivation in the spring when weeds are primed to germinate can create flushes of weed seedlings that um, you can then kill easily. And that goes into preventing seedling establishment. So you can do that with uh, you know, your roll of rye uh, or other cover crops. You can do that with a competitive crop or you can do that with physical control or flaming. Reducing weed competition not only reduces crop yield loss to weeds but also reduces the amount of seeds produced which then reduces future year's problems. So if you get into this um, seed bank management mentality, this is what's going to set you up for easier and easier weed management over time. Reduce seed production, reduce seed pr return, increase predation, increase decay. If you can do those things on your farm, you're going to find that you're spending less time hand weeding or if you're relying on chemistries that your chemistries are going to be less likely to lose control. So a whole other aspect of my work now is on managing herbicide resistance in field crops. And we're at a point where 
we have many conventional growers and chemical companies coming to us for integrated weed management strategies because we're simply not able to get control with a single tool now, with a single herbicide. Um, we have you know, weed species like common water hemp that are multiple resistant to five modes of herbicide action. And so everything that I talked about in this presentation today is actually relevant in completely conventional systems as it is in organic systems. Um, if you're interested in the stuff you saw here, a lot of these slides are available in this Michigan State Extension Bulletin uh, E2931. I wrote this while I was a postdoc back at MSU. Um, I don't believe any of it is out of date. It's all concepts that can be. Um, I also saw in the chats uh, comments that uh, there were some uh, SARE books as well being mentioned. Uh, what was that? Uh, weed management tools. That's the PDF link there. Um, so I've talked a lot. I'd be interested in uh, any, uh, fielding any uh, questions that you might have about the slides or something that I didn't talk about. Thanks very well, much for your attention. Yeah. When, when we work with small farms, you know, uh, say less than five acres and the diversity of crops that they have and cropping systems, what's a really neat aspect, I think, of them in terms of some of these pest control measures is that, that um, they can quickly and easily use multiple methods because if we're talking three 100-foot rows, you know, there's a lot of that stuff we can do by hand. For instance, a lot of the growers we're working with now are using uh, flaming for some weed control. Well, it's pretty easy to go out and do that on three 100-foot rows, rows for a section, you know, versus a 200-acre uh, a, uh, field of something. So uh, there's real advantages to be, you know, growing in these smaller uh, agroecosystems like we see with small farms. You'd be interested in if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, as a graduate student, uh, longer ago than I care to admit now, um, I mean, I, I managed a five-acre research field entirely by hand, and it takes, you know, I, I could get through that in a day if I had to hoe the whole thing. I mean, I would use a wheel hoe for the interrows and a hand hoe for the rows. I mean, so at the very worst, it's a day of hard work. Um, but you, it can be much better than that, too, if you start applying these different tools. And um, so cropping system diversity, absolutely key. But um, it, one of the things I think that uh, you've also got to do is pay attention to where the weeds are in your field. So, you know, keep a weed log, a weed map, and stay ahead of the weeds. Um, the last thing you want to do is have purslane come up on you, you know, in your onions or carrots and only discover it once it's going to seed. You want to know that your purslane is there. And purslane is something that is actually very easy to keep back with a thin grass mulch. And uh, if you've ever tried to pull purslane by hand, you know that it's a real bear if you're pulling it in carrots. But carrots come through um, the grass mulch very nicely, and you put up some more on after it's grown a little bit, and that purslane will stay right down. OK, so I'm seeing some uh, questions up here. How do you create a harborage for beneficials without pests also using the same area to multiply? Um, what I've seen in the balance is that we have not gotten severe pest effects from having greater diversity in the system. Um, so for example, when we've used um, rolled rye mulches, uh, we, we, were look, we were on the lookout for increased white mold incidence in our beans. We didn't see that um, in our clover and alfalfa systems. Um, did see more. Uh, seed predator activity, did not see a lot of uh, increased insect pests. I mean, part of it is that you've got a lot of pests of insects. You know, the predators of insects are also using that uh, increased habitat. I think one of the ways that things get out of balance is when you come in with a heavy hammer and are wiping out a lot of stuff, 
you know, like a pyrethroid or stuff, and uh, and then you're losing your you know, predators of the pests. Um, question from Tom: Do you apply grass mulch before direct seeded crops emerge or after? I would apply it after. Um, you want to give. I mean, so if you're in a transplanting situation, that's the easiest. If you've got a situation where you you know you you've got carrots. Um, I would let them get up a little bit and then seed underneath, uh, mulch right underneath them, let that carrot canopy get up there. Um, one of the things that you can do that's very nice with a flamer is to use something called a solarium, which is a pane of glass or a small piece of plastic, and it heats up the soil underneath that you know, window pane, basically, and brings up your weeds or, or your crop seed a few days before the rest of it's coming up. And the reason that's useful is that, um, let's say you've got carrots, you can bring those carrots up a day in advance. That growing point is very sensitive, but if you know exactly when it's coming up because of your solarium, you can get in there and flame everything right close to when that crop's coming up. You've got a clean uh, soil surface, the carrot comes up clean, and then go ahead and apply your mulch right underneath that, and then you've got a great head start. You know, the, the main thing about maintaining good weed management in organic and integrated weed management systems is maximizing selectivity between the crop and the weed um, by giving the crop a head start. Hey, Adam. Tom also asked, it, it's kind of a yes or no question. Those are always trick ones, I think, but he asked, would mulching be a good idea for any vegetable crop? Are you willing to throw out a yes or no on that? For any vegetable crop? Um, right. You know, uh, so here's the situation where I would say no. Um, so John, after he did that mulching experiment with me, decided to do the roll of rye rather than just doing the mulch. And he did it on a large scale and ended up having really bad problems with mice attacking his tomato seedlings. And so what he learned from that was that he needed a larger head start for his seedlings before he was challenging them with that surface residue. So he actually began to transplant, larger transplants, let them get a bit bigger, and then mulch underneath, and then he didn't have the mice problems. I think it can be a good practice but it's probably not one that you can use without modifying it based upon what the crop is. Um, let's see if we can get caught up here too, Adam. Uh, main crops are not corn and soybean, but a mixed market garden, which most of our growers online would be. Um, is there a crop rotation uh, you would advise? And I think I know how you're going to answer this, but go ahead. I mean, I, I hate to say it depends, but. Um, so if you're trying to if you're trying to relay multiple crops in the season, um, I think you always want you know a good cover cover crop in the fall. And I think uh, one of the things I've done in my own garden market garden now is I um I sheet compost, and um, I, I've been finding that the amount of um, biological activity that I've gotten from that greatly reduced the um, the weed seed bank. There's been a huge amount of um, earthworm activity, ground beetle activity, much better infiltration, and much better tilt. So I mean, I think starting with a good soil building um, rotation, either using a good soil building cover crop or a composting technique in the fall is really critical. And then within the uh, growing season, you know, I think you want to think about heavy feeders and light feeders, um, different types of root systems. You want to think about um, growing crops when they're most vigorous. So, you know, I, I would say avoiding, you know, lettuce mixes in high summer just because they're not as competitive. And, you know, focus on chard and right in the hottest part of the summer. So maintain good crop sequences that allow the crops to be competitive. Uh, do you seed directly into the dead cover crop, or is it better to turn the cover crop under? 
Uh, I, an I answered that one online, Adam. If you see my, I mean, you can add to it. Certainly, I tried to answer that one online. It's a technical issue, and it just takes a while to get good at it. You need a good heavy seeder with a lot of downward pressure. So, in a field crop situation, you know, I'm using a John Deere Max Emerge with the culture set for full downward pressure. If you're direct seeding, as a small five-acre grower, if I were going to do that system, I would transplant into it rather than direct seed into it, to be perfectly honest. Um, you, you're going to get two to three inches of rye residue if you've got a good crop that you're letting, you know, we use a rustic rye or high rye, and you know, the, the rye is seven feet tall when we are rolling. Yeah, tillage radish is great. Wonderful for creating good aeration and infiltration. Okay, Adam, I think it looks like we've got through everybody here. I want to thank you for taking time joining us uh, in the series this year. I'm sure we're going to try and ask you back. Uh, hope you'll be able to, to join us. Yeah, um, so everyone, be glad that you were on today and look forward to, to seeing a lot of you for the rest of our series through the, the rest of the, year, uh, the season here. And uh, Deborah, you're online there. You always help me out in the chat box. I thank you for that. So thanks, everybody. Um, with that, Adam, we'll let you go, and we'll say goodbye to all the participants and hope to see you next week. Great. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.